Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. This is episode 92 and we're ending this season of Worldview with a review of the top 10 stories of 2022 that we discussed here with a view to what will make the headlines and what Indian diplomacy should be watching out for in 2023, particularly as India hosts the G20 summit in September and hopes to have the entire global leadership visiting. So let's get right to the list of the top 10 really big stories of the year. The first, of course, is the Ukraine war. And February 24th marked a watershed moment, a game changer in geopolitics after Russian President Vladimir Putin decided to invade Ukraine, bomb civilian and military targets there, hold referendums that were seen by many in the Western community as a sham, annex four regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson, sending nearly 8 million refugees out of Ukraine to other parts of Europe. Russia has also taken many military losses over the year, more importantly, a big economic loss with the US, EU, and a total of about 40 countries joining sanctions against Russian oil, against Russian banks, military hardware, and other businesses. So what should India expect in 2023? To begin with, more Western pressure to reduce oil imports from Russia, given India in particular has just over the year increased its intake 21 times from about 43,000 barrels uh, per day to 960,000 barrels per day, something the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Koelba really came out and criticized very recently. Now, the United States may remove sanctions from Venezuelan oil, for example, uh, India may also reconsider, and we'll talk a bit about that, restarting Iranian oil imports. Uh, the second thing to watch out for is perhaps not so much pressure on the votes and the resolutions at the UN that we've been hearing so much about, because India leaves the UN Security Council uh, in 2023, in fact, on the last day of 2022, when its two-year elected tenure runs out. Uh, the third thing to watch out for is Prime Minister Modi has a pending visit to Moscow. He was unable to schedule a meeting as was planned for the Russia-India annual summit in December. Also, President Putin is invited to the SCO summit in India, expected sometime in mid-2023, as well as the G20 in September. And we'll tell you more on those in just a bit. Um, Mr. Modi also has possible visits to the US and to the UK, and those could be planned early in the year. And incoming visitors will be French President Macron, German Chancellor Scholz. We're expected to visit around March, April next year. And we are expected to see progress in the India, UK and India, EU FTA talks as well. So there's a lot really going on diplomatically there. Uh, the second event really to watch out for China-India tensions. If India-Russia friendship is one driver of foreign policy next year, tensions with China certainly will be another. The clashes in Tawang this month after PLA soldiers attempted to take over an Indian post uh, seem to be the latest provocation in the nearly two-year military standoff along the line of actual control between the Indian Army and the People's Liberation Army or the Chinese Army. While 2022 saw some disengagement at points, at least three points still remain unresolved, without which any forward movement diplomatically certainly seems very difficult. Economically, however, both countries have taken bilateral trade to new heights of $115 billion over the year, 34% actually higher than the previous year. So what should India look to expect in, in 2023? One, certainly it looks like more attacks by the PLA at different points of the LAC and just how that could change India's engagement with a post-party Congress, Xi Jinping, uh, will be very important to see. Uh, there are opportunities for bilateral talks ahead of a possible visit by Xi Jinping for either the SCO or the G20, neither or perhaps even both. Much will depend on the next few months and how that plays out. The third, with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visiting Beijing fairly soon, U.S.-China ties may actually improve. They may have more talks between them, but this is really being seen as analysts as tactical peace, not strategic security, because the U.S. has made it clear it sees China as a major threat. The third big event, Afghanistan, Pakistan and the terror threat, is a story to watch for. As Afghans prepare for another winter under Taliban rule, 
that is, and remember, the Taliban has not kept a single promise on government, women, or minorities thus far. India must really decide how much to improve or whether to improve its engagement with the Taliban regime in Kabul. Remember, at present, India is engaging and does maintain a uh, technical mission in Kabul with diplomats there. While Taliban-Pakistan tensions may be positive from India's threat perception point of view, the burgeoning number of terror groups, including the lashkar e toiba and the jaish e mohammed based in Afghanistan, is not. So what should India expect? One, closer coordination, since it can't do it with Pakistan, certainly with Central Asian countries, Iran as well, on dealing with Afghanistan. Uh, especially with that SCO summit, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, Midia, where all the leaders will attend. Now, this becomes interesting because Pakistan's leadership is also invited to the SCO process in March 2022. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari is expected at the foreign minister's meeting. Uh, and then Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, or whoever's the Prime Minister in Pakistan at the time, will be expected a few months later to visit India. Second, with Pakistan now off the Financial Action Task Force's grey list, India should brace for more threats. Uh, in fact, India will begin its own scrutiny on financial uh, uh, action uh, really in March 2022. That's something to watch out for. Then as the Taliban steps up its regulation against women's wor women working, girls education, other restrictions, expect that the Afghan non-Taliban opposition, both inside and outside the country, will begin to organize itself as we saw at a conference in Tajikistan recently that Worldview had covered. The fourth news item to watch out for, COVID ending this year. Uh, while uh, the rest of the world, and I'm, I, I know that's sounding very optimistic, but while the rest of the world has more or less dealt with the COVID pandemic, WHO is now saying it hopes it will no longer be an emergency in 2023. China is experiencing at present a new wave of COVID cases, which could eventually circle back, remember, to the rest of the world. That's the way it's been. Since 2020, remember, the world has seen a total of 646 million cases of COVID-19, more than 6.6 .6 million deaths. So what should India expect diplomatically in 2023? Uh, at the G20, at the, WTO, at the WHO's annual uh, assembly as well, India is likely to raise the issues of intellectual property rights, of medical supplies, equitable distribution of vaccines, something India has learned a lot of lessons on. Second, India will also raise the issue of the origins of the virus, studying where the virus came from. Particularly given tensions with China and the LAC are growing, there's no need for India to pull its punches and on the international stage. Uh, COVID recovery could also speed up this year, the economic recovery, so long as there are no more uh, variants. Um, but pre-pandemic growth levels are still very much out of everyone's reach and India's foreign policy will have to take into account the economic policy. The fifth big item to watch out for is climate change and climate justice for the first time being spoken about officially, something India has been calling for for years, but at a last minute deal reached in Egypt this month, countries uh, at the COP27 agreed to a loss and damage clause. And we talked about it on, w, uh, on Worldview. Uh, at the next COP28 in the UAE, there's hoping to be more clarity on just how much countries will pay, which countries will pay, how much will they pay, and who will actually benefit from measures for climate victims. Uh, so this is an important debate through the year. What will India expect in 2023 from it? With global warming impacts and pollution growing, expect more pressure on India and developing countries to cut their coal usage, move to renewable energy. It's a pressure that India has staved off so far. According to a new World Bank report, and the Hindu reported about it, 60% of South Asian populations suffer from exposure to high air pollution. And that World Bank report also called for India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other regional countries to begin a dialogue on air pollution. Whether they will or not, this is certainly an interesting point. Uh, the new fusion project, many of you may have read about, it's a breakthrough made in the US on uh, fusion could, if it is successful, prove a turning point in alternative energy sources, renewable energy particularly. Um, so this will, uh, this will also help. And climate change and justice are expected to be on the G20's agenda for India as well. So we're halfway through our list. We do have five more. The number six is Iran protests. Uh, and few really expected at the beginning of this year, certainly no one expected it, but few expected that the protests in Iran against the death of Masa Amini, who died in September this year, 
uh, to last as long as they have already. They have galvanized hundreds of thousands of Iranians on the streets, demanding an end to the mandatory hijabs and calling, in fact, for the Islamic regime leadership to step down. While some leniency by the government is seen these days as an attempt to bring the protests under control, dozens have been killed or executed for protesting. And the unrest is the biggest such problem for the Iranian government in a decade. So these are tricky relations. Diplomatically, what should India expect in 2023? Um, the Modi government, for one, has backed Iran on the international stage over these protests because uh, it has abstained on votes to censure Iran at the Human Rights Council earlier and then more recently on a vote to evict Iran from the UN Women's Commission. Iran actually lost both those votes, but India certainly stood by it. Um, there will be possibly some pressure from the West on this count. India is also hoping to re-energize the Chabahar project, a uh, port project for trade to Afghanistan, to Central Asia, also to connect up to Russia through the international north-south transport corridor. Uh, so that's another area of talks and what will be watched most closely if India does go ahead and restart oil imports from Iran that was shut down in 2018-2019 under pressure from the United States. But now, given the price of oil, quite possible that India could consider uh, reopening those ties. Uh, number seven, the West Asian countries courting China much more closely. And this is something worth uh, really watching since the Xi Jinping visit to Saudi Arabia uh, came at a, a certain time when the US-Saudi relationship was rocky. Uh, it's rocky, been rocky for a number of reasons. The US President Biden's visit to Riyadh didn't actually improve matters given his comments on the killing of journalist Khashoggi there. Then in a big surprise, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Riyadh, as I said, signed 34 agreements along with Prime Minister and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS as he's called. Uh, Xi Jinping attended a regional summit that brought in all the major Gulf country leaders. And this was important. Remember, even the Qatari Emir who was in the middle of the FIFA World Cup came for this. Uh, so watch this space in 2023. And what should India watch for? One, India, like the US, must watch China's growing influence in different regions, including the Gulf, Iran, Central Asia, and all the rest, uh, especially as India is trying to improve its ties there. Remember, just a few weeks before welcoming Xi Jinping, MBS had actually planned to visit Delhi and had cancelled that visit at the last minute for reasons really unexplained. Uh, he also cancelled a visit to Pakistan in the same week. They were said to be over scheduling issues. Uh, but really, that is a point of concern because India is still waiting really for uh, Saudi Arabia to come through on a number of various announcements they've made, including as much as up to uh, uh, $100 billion in investments. Remember, India is also building bilateral ties in West Asian countries, especially the UAE, with a number of bilateral visits between the two. Prime Minister Modi went there as well. Uh, agreements and the I2U2 Quad, as it's called, with US and Israel. Uh, India will also be working very closely with the UAE, perhaps with Saudi Arabia on the G20. Uh, and the UAE is also going to host the COP28 next climate change summit. So number eight now is the economic crisis in the neighborhood to watch for. While the news over Sri Lanka's debt, Pakistan's default, Bangladesh's economic downturn, they've all improved slightly. We're not hearing as much about them at the end of the year. India still does have to worry about a severe economic crunch in the neighborhood with an overall 1% drop in GDP across the region. So what should India expect? One, that COVID-19 cuts in tourism expenditures, exports and remittances have all affected the region. India will need to lead the way out of it for its neighbors, obviously minus Pakistan at present where there are no trade relations at all. India-Pakistan tensions in fact continue to hold up any kind of SARC summit, uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation Summit. Uh, but we have seen meetings of the BIMSTED grouping, which is more towards the east, South Asia East, if you like, uh, as well as the BBI and Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal grouping that has moved forward on electricity trade. It still does not have a full agreement on the motor vehicles uh, agreement, the MVA, as it is called, to allow smooth transport. Nine, number nine now is the G20. As host of the G20 this year, Indian diplomacy certainly has its work cut out. And you've been watching uh, on media, social media, all of India's preparations coming to the fore. 
It's going to, India will host the top 20 economic leaders at various events across the country. And what should India expect? In September, all the leaders of the world will visit Delhi for the G20 summit, including P5 leaders, UN Security Council permanent members like US President Biden, UK PM Sunak, uh, the Chinese leadership, the Russian leadership from France, Indonesia, Japan, Brazil, and all the rest. Uh, Pre-summit diplomacy will also be at top speed in the next few months. External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar is expected to be on his feet continuously traveling, building consensus, ensuring the participation of all the leaders to the Indian G20. The thorny Russia-Ukraine issue is expected to be one of the biggest problems again in 2022. Remember, after all of that going back and forth by the Indonesian president, uh, Vladimir Putin actually attended the SCO summit uh, in, in Samarkand, in uh, Uzbekistan that Worldview had covered, but he skipped the G20 eventually. India is set to host about 200 meetings for G20, some of which are underway already and at about 50 venues. All eyes will be on which of those meetings will be held in places like the Kashmir Valley, in Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, given disputes with China and Pakistan. But of course, a lot of color, a lot of India's history coming right up on stage during the year. And that brings us to number 10 and the way forward on foreign policy. Is it going to be non-alignment 3.0 given India's balancing act? This is the final point, and it's about this general direction that Indian foreign policy seems to be taking, especially after the Ukraine war. And all the comments we've heard through the year, really, from External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar affirming India's independent foreign policy and his refusal to be pulled into one global camp or another. What should India expect? One, certainly more pulls and pushes from either side of the global camp. As the Russian economy reels from more sanctions and will require more support, and the US and the EU demand more cooperation from countries like India. India will certainly find common cause with countries like the UAE, like Indonesia, Egypt, countries that have close ties with the US but are asserting their strategic autonomy and their ties with Russia and China as well. Uh, the invitation from India to the Egyptian president al-Sisi as the Republic Day chief guest in January 2023 is being seen as a pitch to other non-aligned countries as well and comes despite several years, remember, of India rejecting the non-aligned movement. Prime Minister Modi stayed away from all these summits uh, and that leads many to the conclusion that a new non-alignment 3.0 may be the way forward now for India, one which will be defined as an economic and strategic charter for countries unwilling to be drawn by competing global rivalries. And this is the space most worth watching because after several years of hearing about uh, realpolitik and realistic foreign policy, walking away from ideological pinnings of India's foreign policy, the last year has really seen the biggest turnaround, if you like, in India asserting foreign policy ideologies and ideals, if you like. We hope to return in 2023 to help unpack these new directions in this year of uh, geopolitics ahead and in India's choices on foreign policy. Before I go, I wanted to share some books that maybe I haven't spoken about on any of the specific shows, but I've enjoyed reading this year. Uh, these aren't necessarily in any order, but I certainly uh, hope you find them interesting. Uh, one is something I have spoken about on climate change called The Nutmeg's Curse by Avitab Ghosh. This is really a must read. Climate change is really too big to ignore. Uh, and this is a book that really uh, unpacks it for you. Putin's Wars by Mark Galeotti. Look out for a Hindu podcast where I interview Mark Galeotti as well. Talks about all the wars that Putin has been involved with. And this is a controversial book called Nehru's India, A History in Seven Myths by Taylor C. Sherman. I don't really agree with many of the conclusions. It's a very critical look at Pandit Nehru, but it is important to engage with an outsider's view of Indian foreign policy and history. And there have been others like Jafalo and others that we have spoken about who have been critical of more modern, or newer leaders of India, including Prime Minister Modi. So it is worth engaging with. Uh, another book, a quick read called Spy Stories Inside the World of RNAW and ISI by Adrian Levy and Kathy Scott Clark. It's a fairly fantastical look at how those two uh, agencies operate. 
uh, and certainly uh, has has created its own controversies. Then comes a book called Women's Planning, Nav Navigating Activism, Politics and Modernity in Pakistan. This has been edited by Sherry Rahman, who is now the Environment Minister, very successful at the COP27 negotiations uh, as the head of what is called the Group of 77. Um, and is a very interesting look from the Pakistani point of view. A book called Fallen Idols, History is Not Erased When Statues Are Pulled Down, It Is Made. Now this is by a very young author, she's called Alex Von Tunzelman. Um, and it's certainly a very irreverent look at what seems to have become a trend across the world of pulling down statues, trying to erase and rewrite history. A book called How to Stand Up to a Dictator by Maria Ressa. Uh, who ha has appeared on Worldview before, Nobel Laureate in 2021. And then The Age of the Strongman, How the Cult of the Leader Threatens Democracy Around the World. Very interesting new book by Gideon Rachman, which I'm just about to start. Uh, and this book, which I haven't read yet, called The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World. This is by Ian Bremer. Uh, finally, to this book, which I really have enjoyed reading, and I hope you do too. It's called Around the World in 80 Books by David Damrosh. Uh, and, and, and really, this is a ready reckoner that you keep with you while you're reading other books. Uh, and, and you will find it very interesting because it tells you about the entire world in just 80 books. So here's to another year of reading, watching, and world viewing to all uh, from the team here. Thanks for watching and a very happy 2023.